Open up your Bibles to Mark chapter 11. Mark chapter 11. In, in a lesson that will probably prove to be a little bit shorter of a Bible study because the next section that I have is epically large. So I, I don't want to try to tackle that and tackle this at the same time. So, um, of course, any time that the pastor says this service will be, this sermon will be a little bit shorter, just laugh hysterically because, you know, it's probably not true. Um, Mark chapter 11, verses 15 to 19. So they came to Jerusalem. Then Jesus went into the temple and began to drive out those who bought and sold in the temple, overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he would not allow anyone to carry wares through the temple. Then he taught them, saying to them, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of thieves? Then the scribes and the chief priests heard it and sought how they might destroy him. For they feared him, because all the people were astonished at his teaching. When evening had come, he went out of the city. Now, this particular portion of uh, Mark chapter 11, which we have covered so far, verses 1 to 24, <coughs> one of the primary things that we're talking about uh, and where I've, I've tried to go with this, I, I hope it fits, is this whole idea of fruitfulness. From the idea of Jesus fulfilling uh, so many Old Testament prophecies in going public by uh, rolling into the city the way that he did, openly allowing people to declare him as the Messiah. But then in the midst of that... <coughs> that whole event, and as triumphant and as amazing as that whole event was, then sandwiched in there is this whole thing about Jesus cursing the fig tree. And it just was an odd, to me, it was just an odd thing to put into the narrative. But I think that we worked that out pretty good uh, last Thursday, I think. Um, partly because the fig tree uh, was a symbol for national Israel, and that national Israel had not been bearing fruit for a long time, and that now they would suffer the results or the consequences of that. And, and kind of the ultimate consequence of their fruitlessness was their failure to recognize their Messiah when he rolled into town in fulfillment of everything that God had already said about him. God said, this is the way that it's going to go. He does it, and kind of not a lot of people paid attention. Certainly not the people that could have and should have, which would have been the religious leaders of the day. Because the common folks recognized this. And as he's rolling into town, they're shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the kingdom of our father David that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. I mean, that's all messianic fulfillment right there. And uh, Jesus certainly didn't stop them, even though the religious leaders of the day tried to get him to stop them. Uh, they didn't. So we were talking about that fruitless uh, and fruitfulness that whole thing about the fig tree. And uh, that was last week. And so tonight uh, is uh, keeping his house clean. That ought to sound good on the audio. Glug. <laughs> now, so Jesus at this point is after the triumphal, what we call the triumphal entry. Again, you know, this is the last few days of his life on earth. There's a lot that goes on in the Gospel of Mark in this last week of his life. As a matter of fact, a pretty fair chunk of Mark's gospel is taken up with that time period. And uh, this is uh, chronologically the second time that Jesus clears out the businessmen from the temple. The first time we have recorded over in John chapter 1, verses 13 to, no, verses, well, technically, ah, I got that reference wrong. John chapter 1, 13 to 17. Sorry, that's what it says up on the screen. That is incorrect. What would it be? John chapter 2, verses 13 to 17. Ignore the big screen up above your hedge there. John chapter 2, verses 13 to 17. When Jesus cleanses the temple again, this is probably, eh, would have been obviously very early on in his ministry, um, I don't know if it would have been the 
first thing he did in his ministry, but darn close to it because, again, it's the Passover just like it is now here in Mark chapter 11. And he found uh, in the temple those who sold oxen and sheep and doves and the money changers doing business. And he made a whip of cords. This is the instance where uh, Jesus goes totally ninja on everybody that's there. And he drove them all out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen and poured out the, uh, uh, the changers' money and overturned the tables. And, and he said to those who sold doves, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. Then his disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house has eaten me up. And so here we have this second experience of Jesus going into the temple and clearing out uh, those who were doing business there. Now, history suggests, and I think it's probably true, that um, is what you call sanctified speculation, that where they had set up all of this business was in what was historically called the court of the Gentiles. And so there was a special section set aside so that anybody that was not Jewish could come and worship at the temple. Again, uh, here and also in John, Jesus refers to this, and very specifically here in verse 17, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. And so effectively, if, if, this, if this sanctified speculation be true, the court of the Gentiles is where they were selling official collector's edition, get them while they're hot, collect the whole set, offering coins. And that is, is if you wanted to put a coin in the offering in the temple, you can't just take money out of your pocket and do that. Yeah, you had to buy the special coins that go in there. And, you know, it's like, it's like if you came in here and said, you can't just put money in the offering box. You have to use our special Calvary Chapel dollars. And one Calvary Chapel dollar will cost you $2. So for every, every dollar you want to put in the offering, it's going to cost you $2. I mean, that's what it was. They're doing business and they're, and they're making money. And then, oh, oh, you want to sacrifice an animal. Well, you, you, can't, you can't sacrifice that thing in here. You have to buy our special, specially bred, specially raised, anointed. The high priest touched these animals first, so now they've got this special anointing on them. And the high priest, when he perspired, he wiped his head with this handkerchief and he rubbed it on this animal, so it's got the special anointed perspiration. I mean... <laughs> Has anything changed, you know, in 2,000 years? And, and so you had to buy their animals, you had to buy their coins to do anything there in, in their temple. But if you're a Gentile, if you're not a Jew, or if you're an unbeliever, and you just want to come and see what's going on there, what would you see when you rolled into the temple? Ah, this place is like a flea market. You know, I mean, it, it'd be a, it is, it's a big step down from a farmer's market, at least a farmer's market. You know, there's something useful there. But hey, if I'm, if I'm showing up to worship, and this is the only space that you give me to worship in, and all this stuff is going on here, you know, maybe I don't want to hang around here, you know, because it's just not very welcoming. So Jesus kicks all of these people out. You know, you've turned this into my father's house into a den of thieves. I like that. They're conducting business. Jesus told his disciples, occupy until I come, which I think it's in the NIV says, do business until I come. Well, what business are we to be occupied with? Well, we're to be, we're to be occupied with God's business. Not just our business, but God's business. And so here's people that are occupied with business, but it ain't God's business. Does God really need the money? No. Uh, does God really care whether you have the official collector's edition special anointed coin to put into the offering? I don't think he does. So after Jesus kicked all of these guys out of here for turning, if, if this is, again, I'm a sanctified speculation. I, I'm not 100% positive. But if this was, in fact, the court of the Gentiles, Jesus kicked all of them out once, what did they do after the first time he kicked them all out? Apparently, they moved right back in again. 
Okay. Now this is a clue for you and me if we want to remain fruitful in our Christian life. Letter A, for you note takers, is this. Don't bring back in what he throws out. Okay. These guys had rebuilt. Remember, if we, if we look at John chapter 2 and think, okay, that's the beginning of Jesus' ministry, and we look at Mark chapter 11 and think this is the end of Jesus' ministry, it's about three years. How long did it take them after Jesus kicked them out the first time? I'm thinking the next Sabbath they were right back there again. That's, that's just me. I don't really know. So these guys had just rebuilt what Jesus had kicked over. In other words... What he had done had little or no lasting impact on them. I know a lot of people that call themselves Christians, and you know, if somebody tells me they're a Christian, I believe them. I believe them. I I, I, I got to give you the benefit of the doubt, but I'm going to watch you too. I'm going to watch you, and I want to see is there any you know outward evidence of that. And I think that there's an awful lot of people out there that respond or react in a moment to something that they hear, they have a religious experience, or they hear a compelling message, or they're in a, a place in their life where they're emotionally or spiritually vulnerable, and they react or they respond to the, the, the invitation to come forward and receive Christ. And I get it, and I totally understand it. And um, I've worked a lot of evangelistic events, big ones, you know, and, and was part of a huge church that was massively evangelistic. I mean, I saw people saved every single service, every single week, week in and week out for every single year that I was there. I never saw a Sunday where people didn't get saved, ever. Now, that's pretty impressive, if you ask me. But I also worked the sidelines where we would talk with the people that came forward. And there's an awful lot of people that come forward at, especially the big stadium crusades, which I dig those things, but there's an awful lot of people that come forward on that field that aren't doing anything out there. Um, I mean, I've counseled, I can't even tell you how many times I've counseled, the big crusades have been out on the field, and so my task was to counsel with those that were coming out on the field. And I would approach people that were out there and say, you know, why why did you come? Did you come down here to receive the Lord tonight? Oh, no, no. I just wanted to be down here and be a part of this. I'm like, get out of here, <laughs> you know? And uh, there were a number of times when I was out on the field and we found Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses out there handing out literature for their churches oh, wow. right out on the field as the new believers were coming forward. I mean, there was, we had security out there and... And, you know, people coming out there going, you know, I don't really know why I came forward, you know, and, you know, I'm just going through a hard time in my life. And I'm like, okay. So, you know, my thinking, my experience was of all the people that flooded onto the field, more than half of them were counselors like me. And of the people that came down there that were not counselors, probably 25% of them were genuine salvations. And of those people, probably 10% of them were the real deal. And, uh, and we always tried to do a really good job of following up on everybody that came forward, too, just to, to move those figures up. But just like the parable of the sower, the different seeds and the different kinds of soils, there's lots of people that have that experience, but there's no lasting transformation or change. And there's a lot of different reasons why that is. They... They never responded to what Jesus did with any kind of follow through. And uh, even working the Crusades, I did a lot of the follow up work too, where we'd called people and called them up and said, you know, we, we want to send you some materials. Are you plugged into a church? Do you need some help? Is there anything we can do for you? And a lot of them were like, no, 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 I'm good. Everything's, everything is okay. And they just didn't want to go forward at all. But there's plenty of other people that said, no, man, it's, you know, I, yeah, I got, I'm going to be at a church on Sunday morning. And I'm like, awesome, good to see you there. I'll be looking for you. Let's make sure we connect. I sit right here. Let's, you know. And so we always tried to follow up on that. And when I got saved, there were lots of people that were there like, okay, you need to come, you know, on Wednesday. You need to come on Sunday. And I'm like, I wanted to. I really wanted to do it. But 
it appears, and again, I'm, I'm speculating here, which I understand is a dangerous thing to do when you're preaching God's word, but Jesus kicks over all these tables, chases out all these animals. Did any of them approach Jesus and say, why are you doing this? Did any of them approach Jesus and say, do I need to rethink this whole you know, coin exchange thing? Do I need to rethink this whole selling animals in, in the temple thing? Is there anything? I, maybe some of them did. I, I don't know. But either way, they're back, and here they are. Or were they even aware that what they were doing was preventing others from coming to God? If they're in the court of the Gentiles, they're effectively hindering others from coming to God to worship him. So God has, and he continues to clean out our lives. There's always something that he's doing. You've heard me say this many times. Not always a question of what God's doing in your life. It's a question of what he's undoing out of your life. In my case, that's an awful lot. So God continues to do this, but how much of what he has thrown out have we dragged back in? Now, I was just thinking about this. And I know, it's always dangerous when, the, when I start thinking. So I was thinking about this. When I, when I first got saved, I knew a lot of people that got saved at more or less the same time that I got saved. And um, I mean, right from the get-go, we just kind of went berserk and cleaned out everything. Any kind of book, any kind of record or album or cassette tape or 8-track um, that, that we didn't think was godly, whew, out it went, out it went. Everything, out any, anything that was even remotely sinful, out it went. And, and what we found out later on was, okay, well, some of this stuff isn't a sin. We thought it was, so we tossed it all out, right? You know, I, you know, didn't we didn't drink anything, and we didn't smoke anything, and we didn't listen to anything that we shouldn't listen to. We didn't see movies we shouldn't see, and then and then later on we kind of we kind of eased off on that a little bit, and thought, okay, well, you know, it's not a sin to listen to secular secular music. I'm not going to die, you know, if I listen to the Beatles, thankfully, um, and and you know. Uh, it's you know there's nothing in the Bible that says I can't have a drink and but here was the thing that I got thinking is we chucked all of that stuff right from the get go and had no trouble doing it and now here we are some of us 30 plus years later 35 years later and a lot of my friends that got saved at that same time, they're, they're down at the pub tossing back a few with their friends, and they're still going to church on Sunday. They're still walking with the Lord, but now they don't think anything of cracking a bottle of wine with dinner or having a couple of beers with their pals. And I'm thinking, okay, all right, you know, I get it. It's not a sin. Right? We know, we know that. It's not a sin. But in the beginning, we thought that it was. We found out that it wasn't. But where were we better off? If, our, if we err to the side of holiness, is that a bad thing? If we err to that side. And... And I'll uh, grant you, you know, liberty is liberty. I can't argue with that. But you know what I always say, too? Liberty means you don't have to do it. And I think where a lot of us as Christians went, you know, maybe just slightly off kilter is we thought, if it's a liberty, I get to do it. And so we took liberty and said, I get to do it, so I'm going to. Instead of saying, it's a liberty, but I don't have to. So, I, you know, I, I don't, I guess what I'm trying to say, <laughs> you're like, what are you trying to say? I, I, I think what I'm trying to say is, 
Is it a bad thing to, to make a mistake, but err to the side of holiness as opposed to the side of liberty? And for me, ad admittedly, you know, giving up on a lot of that stuff was just, it was just not an issue for me. There are plenty, I got plenty of other issues. That just wasn't one of them. So not, you know, you know, getting high or getting drunk or anything. That, that, was, that, that was no big deal. And, and it still isn't. But like I said, I got plenty of other issues to worry about. But I just wondered how much of what he threw out of we brought back in. How much of what I voluntarily gave up have I voluntarily brought back in? Was I better off without it or am I better off with it? And I cannot help but think that maybe I'm a little bit better off without it. Yeah, Jim. The thought that comes to mind is basically you were in your first love. And you Good way to put steal, it. You know, and I think a lot of us probably can look back and, and yeah, I mean, it was like, you know, we shared what uh, we uh, believed with the people, even, yeah. if it, uh, even if they mocked us for it or yeah. made yeah. fun of us. Yeah. We didn't care. Yeah. You know? And even if maybe we were a little wrong. We, we had a, a zeal yeah. uh, that maybe went a little bit overboard, but it was our first love manifesting itself. Oh, and, yeah. and now, uh, for many of us, uh, you know, we don't have that, that same spark that we did going up. I am so glad you said that. That is such a good observation. Um, because I think you're spot on. I think that's what it was. I think it was that first love thing. It was that overwhelming sense of joy at being forgiven, uh, at being transformed, at having the crucified, resurrected Christ dwelling in my heart by faith. I remember those days well, and have often thought, what happened to that zeal? And I think, okay, well, you know, I've matured. And I'm thinking, maybe I shouldn't have. You know, and certainly the zeal is tempered now with a little bit more tact, you know, because I wasn't always very tactful back in those days. I put off a lot of people. But, you know, can't we still have the same zeal but with the tact also? You know, can't we still have the same passion? Can't we still experience that same first love? I'm so glad you said that because that's what it is. Here's what the Apostle Paul adds here. I think it applies in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 27, when he says, I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. Now, that leads into my next two little sub-points here. So bear that in mind. You can even keep your finger there in 1 Corinthians 9, 27, make a note, jot it down, whatever you want to do. I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I preach to others, I myself should become disqualified. Because let me clue you. Because what we're aiming at is we're aiming at a holy life which is not necessarily always a happy life. It's a holy life, and it doesn't mean that there's no happiness in holiness. It just means that the aim is a little different. I'm not aiming at the happiness. I'm aiming at the holiness. I believe if I aim at the holiness, I'll get the happiness. If I aim at the happiness, I'm probably going to miss holiness by a mile. That's just what I'm thinking. So, okay, so letter A under this point, keep his house clean. Letter A is don't bring back in what he throws out. Letter B would be a clean house doesn't inhibit spiritual growth. So again, there on, on 1 Corinthians 9, 27, I discipline my body and bring it into subjection. This would fall under the category uh, of those who uh, Jesus kicked out the money changers, selling the animals, turning all of that stuff over, and clearing out the court of the Gentiles, those that had rebuilt and brought all that stuff back in had no concept of their own spiritual bankruptcy. They had no clue that anything that they were doing was wrong. They were simply offended by the fact that Jesus had done this, but had no conscious awareness that what they're doing was inhibiting their own spiritual growth. It's like, dude, you know, lighten up. Or, you know, what gives you the right? Or, judge not Jesus, lest you be judged. You know, I mean, it's, it's like that. It's like saying to anybody that is not a Christian, you know, I don't think you should do that. Or saying to anybody that's not a Christian, 
I think that's wrong. I think that's wrong. Nobody says that anymore. You can't, you can't use that word publicly anymore because people just don't buy it. There's nothing that's wrong. There's just, you know, hey, it's whatever, you know, whatever people want to do, you know, and, and they just didn't have a clue. That's, that's a reminder to us, though, too, when we're talking about these things with unbelieving people. Remember, they don't have a clue. Blind is blind, deaf is deaf. And so when we're talking to you know, non-believing people about spiritual things, and you say, you know what, man, you gotta, you gotta get right, you gotta get washed in the blood, man. You gotta surrender your life to Christ, be reconciled to God. You gotta remember, they don't know what any of that means. They don't know what those words even mean. And getting washed in the blood of the Lamb, no thank you. I mean, that, you know, you know, isn't, isn't there some other way that we can put that, you know, so we don't deceive people, but, you know, at least speak the language of the unbeliever at the same time. The people that just moved everything back in, they had no clue of their own spiritual bankruptcy. But for you and for me, this is the stuff that needs to go, and this is the stuff that needs to stay gone if we we're to grow and move forward in our faith. Um, the Apostle Paul, again, in Philippians chapter 3, you guys are familiar with this passage because you're a biblically literate church, and I love you. In Philippians chapter 3, verses 7 to 11, the Apostle Paul puts it like this, But what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Yet, indeed, I count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. Now, when I read that, I'm not seeing anywhere in here where he says, I count a lot of things lost, and then I matured in the Lord, and I found out that some of the things that were lost I didn't really have to lose, so I've let them back in. <laughs> I'm, I'm not seeing anything like that. As a matter of fact, what I'm seeing is somebody who gladly welcomes personal sacrifice. And I'm a believer, and maybe it's because I'm preaching to myself here, is there just is not a whole lot of personal sacrifice in the 21st century American church. Largely because there doesn't need to be, okay? We, you know, we've got jobs and we live in a beautiful place and all of our needs are met. We don't really need to have much faith. We suffer no persecution. And I don't care what anybody says. Christians are not being persecuted in this country. They're being mocked. They're being made fun of. That's not persecution. I've been to places where Christians are persecuted. I've talked with Christians that went to prison and were tortured for what they believe. We do not suffer persecution in this country. We probably ought to and it'd probably do us a lot of good. So when the world around us is getting a little bit darker and a little bit darker and we're trying to take back America for Jesus, it's like, you know what, maybe he doesn't want it back. If judgment begins first with the house of God, maybe it's time for judgment to begin with the church in the United States of America in the 21st century. Because the Apostle Paul's looking at his world and saying, you can have it all, take it all, I gladly give it all up, there is only one thing one thing that I want and nothing else matters, and that is the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. Just knowing Jesus, that's it. He doesn't need anything else. I love how he draws the line there. Whatever it is that I've had, it's, it's nothing. And look, it, it, look, it doesn't mean that, that we don't own and possess significant things in our life. You know, it, it doesn't mean that we don't like the cars that we drive or appreciate the homes we live in or love the fact that, you know, I've got a, you know, 13 pound carbon fiber bike that I can ride up through the hills anytime that I want to. I love that. That's wonderful. That's amazing. Uh, you know, I love big screen TV. I love having a computer. You know, I, I love all of this stuff. But <laughs> if it all goes, how much loss am I going to feel like I suffered? It, it's almost like 
and honestly, I hope God doesn't do this, but you know, <laughs> if I lost it all, if I lost it all, would I be able to say this? Would I be able to say what things were gained to me? These are the kind of loss for Christ, yet I indeed I count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. You know, you talk to me, maybe not so much, right? I, you talk with people, though, that have lost all things, people that genuinely have lost all things, and they'll tell you that. You know what? I'm alive, and I got Jesus, and so I'm going to be okay. And I'm like, man, would I be able to say that in that moment? And sometimes I don't know. Because I love my comfort so much. I enjoy my comfort and all my privileges and everything. But this thing that we're talking about here, counting all things as loss, don't bring back in what he throws out. It can also be, and I wrote it in my notes like this, it can also be our rally cry for future and sustained growth. Our rally cry for future and sustained growth. Sometimes, you know, we've got, I'm going to look at Hebrews chapter 12. Sometimes we look at our spiritual lives and we think, okay, there, there hasn't necessarily been a whole lot of spiritual growth in my life recently. Why not? Why not? Has there been any sacrifice in your life? How, where's your first love? Where's that? How's that going on? Is there anything in your life that he threw out a long time ago that you've brought back in that honestly, genuinely, you could really do without, and if you did without it, it'd probably improve your the quality of your spiritual life. But then we think, ah, it's a liberty. I want to do it anyways. Okay, go ahead. Do it anyways. But don't complain about no spiritual growth in your life. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. You guys know this one again? Familiar ground here. Therefore, we also... Since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, those are all those that have gone on before us into glory, all those that have served Christ like this, all those that have been the saints, the shoulders that we stand on as the 21st century American church, and those around us and around the world today that are walking with Christ in much more difficult circumstances than you and me. Because we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily entangles. Because there's some things in our life that though they may not be sin, they're still a weight. And somebody uh, a long time ago, I never forgot this, he said, when you're thinking about these kind of things, liberties, what should go, what should stay, think about it and think to yourself, is it a wing or is it a weight? Is it a wing that's going to help me along in my way in my spiritual life, or is it a weight that's going to hold me down or hold me back? And I thought, that's brilliant, because that's a great way to look at things. Is this a wing or a weight? Okay, well, it's not a sin. That's okay, because, uh, you know, we, we got to lay aside our sin, and we get that. We don't even have to talk about laying aside our sin, because we already know that. But what about the weights? What about the weights? You know, some people, when they train, they'll put on, you know, weight belts or weight things on their ankles or their wrist, or like sometimes when I do extra training on my bike, I put all my heavy parts back on the bike so I'm riding a heavier bike so that when I get back on a lighter bike, woo, you know, it's like a rocket ship, you know? But if we've been struggling with those weights in our spiritual life, maybe they're the very reason why we are not winging our way forward. Maybe those are the very things that have held us up when in fact we'd just be a lot better off without them. So lay aside every weight and the sin, we know that part, which so easily ensnares us, we know that part, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now, verse 2, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, puts our sense of personal sacrifice into context. Okay, if I, if I get rid of this thing in my life, okay, it's not a sin, but I would agree it is a weight. 
it's, you know, at, at the very least, it's not a wing, it's not a weight, it's a neutral. And even in my, in my book, if it's a neutral, yeah, you might as well get rid of it. Because what, what good is it really doing? If it's not a wing, get rid of it. If it's a weight, you got to get rid of it. You know that. But then we think about the loss of that thing, whatever it is, my liberty or that thing that I really want. We think about the loss of it and think, well, I really don't want to live without that. I don't want to live without alcohol. That's the easy thing to pick on. And it's not just alcohol. It's just easy to pick on. I don't want to live without that. Okay, now your weight has become a sin. I'm not willing to give it up. Now we've got a problem. Because that liberty now has become bondage. And I've talked with people, and again, alcohol is easy to pick on. I've talked with a lot of people who say, well, you know, it's a liberty. You know, I don't, I don't drink uh, hardly anything at all. And, and I've said this to a couple of different people. Okay, well, quit then. Well, I don't really want to. I said, okay, well, then it's not a liberty any longer. Well, don't judge me. I'm, you know, <laughs> just asking a simple question here. If you don't want to live without it, now we've got a problem. Now it ceases to be a liberty, and now it becomes a bondage. Now, again, it's really easy to make big blanket statements like this, and maybe not everybody would agree with me. Totally cool. I totally understand, it, and I get it. All I'm asking you to do, or me to do, or anybody to do, just give it some thought. Just give it some thought. Is it a wing, or is it a weight? Is it something that's helping me along my way? Is it something that's holding me back? Now, that brings me to my last point. Okay, so we're talking about keeping his house clean. We're talking about don't bring back in what he throws out. We're talking about a clean house does not inhibit spiritual growth. And the last point is this. A clean house encourages others to seek him. That's what the court of the Gentiles was for. The court of the Gentiles was for anybody who was not a Jew who wanted to seek God would have a place to be able to do so. That's awesome. God did that. God commanded that there be a place for anybody. But the businessmen of the temple were actively preventing that. Now, yeah. Okay, the court of the Gentiles. Mm -hmm. Uh, if I'm a Gentile and I go there, what do I see when, uh, let's say, uh, the money changers are not there and right. nobody sells anything? It's an empty courtyard to be able to worship God on the side of the but temple grounds. Do you hear anything? I mean, do you hear worship? I would, I would expect that, that's a really good question. Uh, yeah. I, would, I would expect so that you would. Say, so what? Yeah. You know, I can go over there and stand here and think about God. Yeah. I mean, why here? Special yeah. About it. Well, that, that that's a good question, and all I can give you is speculation. That's all I can give you. Um, so you may not want to listen to anything I have to say about it. But a, a couple of things come to mind right away. Number one is you're there. You're at the temple, and the temple was the center of worship. That's where all the sacrifices happened. That's where just on the other side of this wall from the court of the Gentiles, that's where the priests were doing their priestly duty. That's where they're sacrificing the animals, putting the burnt offerings on the altar. Any music or singing that was going on, I'd be able to hear that. I would be able to see the temple itself. So for whatever... I don't know. I don't know. I'd, I would have brought a box to stand on. I'd, I'd be the guy that's scaling the wall to look over on the other side. And, and what, you know what's another good question is, would there have been priests that were there to minister to those Gentile people? Good question. Yeah, yeah. Super good, super good question. I don't know. I also think that that whole money changing, all that stuff, uh, misrepresents God. Absolutely. Um, and so I would think that that's, you know, when we live that way, we're misrepresenting God by showing, mm -hmm. you know, I would rather do this, even though this isn't a sin, I would rather do this than pray. Right. I think it's the same thing, and I think that fits very neatly under this heading. A clean house encourages others to seek him. Look at it like this, too. Over in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 12, 
and 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 16, verse 12 says, Having our conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may, by your good works, which they observe, glorify God on the day of visitation. In other words, our best defense is a good offense. Uh, same 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 16, same thing. Having a good conscience that when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. Okay, so the idea here is that the best defense against accusation from an unbeliever is a pure and a holy life. Right. Now, the, the, the doggone thing now is there's a lot of people, God bless them, I love them, I don't agree with them, that say, you know, the best way to attract unbelievers is not to be churchy. Don't be churchy. Go to the pub. Have a beer with them. You know, have a glass of wine with the girls at the club. You know, just, you know, don't be offensive or be more like them or whatever. I disagree. I think the thing is to be completely and utterly different. And uh, you know, I, again, I'm you know I'm certainly no paragon of virtue in this regard, but you know, I, I, I told you about doing this procedure at the doctor's one time that was extremely <laughs> uncomfortable, and and the guy that performed the procedure said, you know, what do you do for a living? And I said, well, I'm, you know, I'm pastor of a church, and he goes, that explains it. I'm like, what? And he says, well, you weren't cussing and swearing why I did the procedure, uh, and I'm like, oh, you <laughs> know. Hadn't thought about that, but I, you know, I don't use those words. And I've even had people come up to me and say, uh, "You don't cuss or swear, do you?" And I'm like, "You know, no. You know, I mean, I, I believe that, you know, cuss words and swear words are for people that don't possess an adequate enough vocabulary to be able to properly express themselves. You don't have to say words like that. You can say words like groovy." You know, I, I'm, <laughs> exactly, which is my default setting. Is, ah! <laughs> I don't have to say a word, just blood curdling scream. See, I, I'm thinking here, and I'm, and I'm, as I'm thinking these things, and it, it was especially this point, this keeping his house clean point, that I think is going to lead to some more sermons when we get done with 2 Samuel and will also lead to the next book study that we do on Sunday morning. And, and, and that is, you know, I want to kind of finish this with this. And that is that a clean house is the best way to invite others to, as Psalm 34, 8 says, taste and see that the Lord is good. I think a clean house is the best way to do that. I think a life that is utterly and completely different from everybody else. Do you do this? Nah, I don't do that. Do you like to do this? Not really. What do you like to do? I like to go to Bible study. <laughs> Freak. <laughs> you know, it's like I do. I love coming to church. I love being here. You know, I Judy knows this. Aaron. Aaron knows this too. Kathy knows this. Dan knows this too. Is you know, I love coming on Wednesday night to Mud and Miracles. Because how many people did we have here last night? Little Zach. 30? 26 plus. Tw tw eight. Eight kids. 26. Seven on the ground and one in the arm. Yeah. <laughs> and eight kids with Aaron back there in the back. God bless you. <laughs> God bless you. I mean, it, we were packed. We, we've had over 30 people here on Wednesday night before. And uh, some of these young people are not believers yet, but they're showing up. And they're being invited by their friends. Their parents are coming. Their moms are coming. Their grandmothers are coming now. And, uh, and it's just it's amazing to see. And they're discovering what it means to be different than everybody else. And a clean house is the way to do it. Look, <clears throat> here's the way that God's word puts it. And again, I know this isn't anything you don't already know. But uh, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 18 to 20, God's word puts it like this, flee sexual immorality. I, like, I always like it when God's word tells us to flee. Just run away. Run, a, run screaming in the opposite direction. Don't pause. Just run. Run. I told you to run. <laughs> I just love that. He doesn't say, no, do your best to avoid it. Flee. Just flee. Flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is 
outside the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body? Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Which part of that do we not get? We, I, I think the part that we don't get is you are not your own. You were bought with a price. We See, we don't want anybody to own us. But if you're a Christian, you're owned. And you're owned by him. And it's not like, oh, you know, Jesus set me free to be independent from God. No. No. <laughs> He set you free from bondage to slavery so that you might now be a slave to righteousness. A slave to righteousness. Now, he doesn't say a willing participant in righteousness. He says a slave to righteousness. Do you know that a slave has no will of their own? What does God's word teach us about that? Not my will, but thine be done. So which part of this are we not thinking? Does a slave get to go off and do anything that they want to do? Well, and you, if you're a slave, you, you have to. You have to please your master. What would he have us to do? You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Jesus wants us to keep the house of our lives clean. This is his house. He dwells now in my heart by faith and in yours as well, because I know all of you. So let's think about this. Let's think about keeping his house clean. Again, not just the sins, but how about the weights? Let's pray. Jesus, we want to thank you because you are so kind, and you are so long-suffering, you are so patient with us. And in all the crazy stuff that we mess around with, and thank you, Lord, that your grace is so much bigger than our self-will or our stupidity. So thank you for being patient. Now, Lord, we just pray that you'd show us in our lives, perhaps even right now, the things that, well, we know what the sins are. But show us the things that are the weights. The things that aren't necessarily sins, but they're not helping us move forward. Lord, help us not to be afraid of personal sacrifice. Lord, help us not to be afraid of personal holiness. Lord, help us to remember that our physical bodies are temples of your Holy Spirit. What we experience, you experience. We put you through it. We drag you with us wherever we go, whatever it is that we see, whatever it is we do, whatever we consume. We take you right there with us. So help us to remember, Lord, that the loss of some things in this life is not a bad thing. And that simply knowing you is nothing more important. There's nothing more valuable than, than that. So just refresh our thinking on this, Lord. And even as Jim mentioned earlier, Lord, help us to remember what it means to be in a first love relationship with you. Lord, certainly help us to grow, help us to be tactful. But Lord, we don't want to lose the zeal. So, Lord, we need your help tonight, and we trust that you will, because we ask it from you in Jesus' name. Amen.